Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, this morning, as always, Lord, another opportunity to gather together as your people, or to study your word, to learn more about you, or to grow in our understanding of the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to help one another understand more fully and live more fully in light of the knowledge of you. Lord, please help us by your spirit to to grow this morning in this class. Help us grasp more fully what it means that you uh, uh, are not a dead God, not an absent God, but a living God who is at work among us. Uh, Let that impact our daily lives, Lord, and, and help us encourage our hearts to worship you. Uh, more fervently and with greater understanding in the days ahead because of this morning. Please guard my mouth. Let me not say anything that's unhelpful. Uh, Give us understanding in your word and clarity, Lord, and uh, teach us the the way of your uh, will, and we will run in that way. Help us keep it to the end, Lord. Fill us with joy and gladness and encouragement this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we're... uh, Surprise, surprise, picking back up in the first paragraph of chapter 2 of the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, and uh, Lord willing, we're going to be entering into some challenging waters this morning, and we need to make sure that we keep our ballast in our boat so we don't get blown, blown over. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is going to be brought out more fully in chapter 3, which is speaking about God's decree, and then chapter 5, which is God's providence in relation to the world, how he has ordered all things according to his will. Today is just kind of introducing us to this general subject of how God relates to his creation through his actions. What does he do and what governs what he does? Um, What is the rule by which God moves to relate to his creation? To what end is everything ordered? Um, It's probably my fault. Let me see. Some of you are saying you can't hear me. Okay, is that any better? Maybe a little closer? It's fine. You guys got to forgive me. I, am, I'm, I know that I'm a loud person to begin with, and so I sound much louder to myself in the speakers than, than maybe what I actually am. I'm pretty sensitive on that issue, um, though I get, I get pretty loud sometimes. It's just... It, it's just me. It's just the way I am. And I try to rein that in as much as possible, but uh, sometimes it just doesn't work out. So um, if you can't hear me, definitely let me know, but I always assume that you have no problem hearing me. Um, maybe understanding what I'm saying in light of how loud it gets is, maybe, is my concern. But anyway, so today we're, we're entering into a new part of this first paragraph. The What we've been considering is what God has revealed of himself in his word concerning his essence. What is he? What is he like? Who is he? How do we we describe him is is the better way to say it. And the confession gives us a pretty full description of what God is. 
how God has revealed himself in his word. He is the only God. There's none besides him. He is self-existent. He is infinite in being and perfection. Uh, He's invisible. He's without body, parts, or passions. He's immortal. He dwells in in impenetrable light, uh, which no one can approach. He's unchangeable. He's immense. He's eternal. He's incomprehensible. He's almighty. He's in every way infinite. Absolutely holy. He's perfectly wise and wholly free. Now, all of these kind of combine to paint the picture uh, of God in his essence and in his being, his perfection, as being the ultimate. That God is the ultimate being, period. Uh, He is, as the confession says there, that closing phrase, he is absolutely, or excuse me, completely absolute. R.C. Sproul described that reality uh, this way, that there is nothing relative about God in his being. He is objective. He is eternal. He is absolute. And um, today, that's how that, descript- that section of describing God in his essence closes. Today, we are moving from We are progressing from a description of God in his essence to a description of God in his actions. This is what God is. This is what he's like. But what does he do? Um, Many of you are familiar with deism. Anybody know what deism is? And would you be willing to describe it for the class? Yeah. Yeah, I get the picture of a, uh, like a little wind-up toy. You, know, you wind up the toy and you just set it down and you just let it run until it runs out, right? That's kind of the description of, of, of the deist uh, vision of God's interactions with creation. And many of our founding fathers in this country were deist, right? They believed in a higher power, but they didn't really believe that he had anything to do with his creation. He was, he was distant. He was separated from us. Um, And that was a very common uh, ideology that was on the rise during the time these confessions were written, uh, especially in England. But here we find, uh, and obviously just simply repeating what is stated in Scripture, that God is not like that at all. Uh, God is immense. He is holy. He is absolutely other from anything that we can imagine. He is in his essence, so transcendent that we can never comprehend him. We can never approach him. He's in impenetrable light. All of that is true about God. But that does not mean that God is absent from us or that he's not working among us or is not within his creation, though in his essence he is completely beyond his creation. Uh, The Confession acknowledges God's word. God makes plain in his word that Yes, he is entirely beyond us, but he is also imminently, uh, he is also eminence. He is with us. And I just gave away a question I was going to ask you. What is this reality describing? It's, it's describing the, uh, it's describing God in his transcendence and God in his imminence. Um, and this is a remarkable truth that God's revealed of himself in his word it goes uh, completely contrary to what any other human mind can conceive of when it thinks to formulate an idea of God. That God is, at the same time, utterly beyond us, unapproachable. We can't grasp him, and yet very, very near to each one of us. Um, that, it's like the Trinity, right? This, this idea of the Trinity. It just could not have been conceived of in the human mind. Because the human mind cannot bring these two realities to come together in harmony. In our minds, they're, they're, they're utterly opposed to each other. How can God be, in his essence, be entirely outside of us, and yet at the same time, in his essence, be very approachable and very near to us? Um, that is the reality that God's word presents to us. And though our minds cannot comprehend it because we are finite beings and we live in in this limited space and time dimension and, 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 and with sinful and corrupted understanding even, we can't grasp it. Nevertheless, it is true. 
that God is not far from each one of us, as Acts 17.27 says. The God who made the world and all things in it, who does not dwell in temples made with human hands, is at the same time the one who is not far from each one of us. God's nearness to us is manifested in God's actions. How would you know God's nearness as the one who is unseen? How would you know that God is very present with us as the one who is invisible and who has no body to see? How do we, how do we sense God's hand among us when we can't see that hand, quote unquote. Miss Susan. Oh, yeah, it can be if you want it to be. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, that's good. Sure. That's right in line with this. Yeah. Um, we, we see God's presence through answers to prayer. Yeah, very good. Anything else you can think of? Miss Teresa. Yeah. Yeah, coincidence, as some people say. That, that gives evidence of God's nearness. That's, that's what the chapter on providence is really all about, that God is intimately involved in every single event that takes place in this world, in his creation. If he's not, then that event wouldn't take place. It couldn't take place. And so, yeah, we see, we see God, God's nearness in what some people call coincidence. Anything, anything else you can think of? It kind of gets to the heart of it. We, we see God's nearness. We sense his nearness to us through his actions. That God is working and he's moving and he's ordering and sustaining and creating and causing things to be. That, and that, that's, this is a reality that, that really can give a lot of comfort to your soul if you will spend time meditating upon it. When you wake up in the morning, guys, it's only by God's sustaining hand that you opened your eyes, right? What is it? Uh, Is it Psalm 3 that says that? I I went to bed. I awoke because your hand sustained me. Um, When you you get in your car and you make it safely to work, it's only God's actions of upholding that car and keeping the engine running and, and, and sustaining you with life and breath and all things, it's only by that sustaining action of God that you know God is with you as you're driving that car. You know, very often, we, we tend to relegate God's nearness to an experience. It's, it's defined by an experience. And that, the experiential aspect of the Christian life is very necessary and it's very true. And any of you guys who know me know that I emphasize experience A lot. You need to be experiencing the nearness of God. But that experience is not an experience that's divorced from understanding. You experience the truth and the reality of God in your heart through your mind. It's, It's through the renewal of the mind that you come to prove God's will, that which is good and acceptable and perfect and pleasing to him. And so... Anyway, this, this can have great, great effect on your life, on your daily life. If you will spend time during your day disciplining yourself for the purpose of godliness to meditate upon this reality, that God's nearness to you is made known through God's works. And those works are defined in Scripture as his, his creation, his creating, the creating element of his work, the sustaining element of his work, preserving his creatures, being near to them, as Acts 17 would say. So we know God's nearness, this unseen God, this unperceived God dwelling in unapproachable, uh, unapproachable light. We, we discern his nearness through his works. God's activity in his creation, that activity that extends over all of creation, uh, manifests the reality that he's very near, very near. Now that leads to the question, What governs his actions towards his creatures? What governs, what, what is the governing element that resides, that, 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 that rules over God's actions, if you could put it that way? 
Is it anything outside of God? Go ahead, brother. He does whatever he pleases, yeah. So who's, what does that mean for the question? What, what's ruling his actions? His will. No. Susan? Absolutely. Yeah, our experiences must be uh, in line with God's word if we're going to say that they are from the Lord. But yeah, but what we're talking about here is strictly God's workings in, in just creation, right? And his nearness is manifested in his creation by his upholding, preserving, governing, guiding. That just reminds me of, of something that I meant to announce at the beginning of class. Um, though it doesn't bother me, because I'm, not, I'm, I'm always here in this class. Uh, it does bother some other people who can't make it to this class that they can't hear your comments. And so I have gone through the recordings the last three uh, Sundays and I've tried to amplify uh, where, you're, where you're giving uh, comments and whatnot. I've tried, tried to make that louder so that people can hear it on the audio recording, but it's still not good enough. And so, we have options now. We can either revert back to uh, you coming up to the mic to make your comments, which I have noticed seems simply to uh, kind of cut off that element of interaction with you, A, because you're too lazy to get up to the mic, or B, <laughs> you, yeah, well, I don't know what else it would be. What else is it? No. <laughs> Just not awake yet. I don't know. No. That, that, was not a, that was not a baseball bat to your face. Okay, I was not, I didn't mean it like that. I wasn't trying to be offensive. Um, or uh, what we can do is go back to something we used to do, which is having a runner with the mic. And if you have a comment, just raise your hand and someone can bring the mic to you. Here's my issue with that. It always turned into like one person doing it every week. And I don't want that to be the case because then someone is distracted and it is not, I'm gonna state this plainly, it is not going to be Dick Magler running the mic. We're we are sitting you down, brother. No, I mean, unless you really want to, a Sunday a month or something. But if, if you guys would be, if any of you men would be willing to do that, um, just maybe come see me after class today and we'll, we'll try and work up a, a system where we can do that. If not, then, I guess it's just more incentive for uh, people to try to be here. I don't know. I mean, I, that's that's kind of saying that facetiously because I know that there are there are other there are, there are good reasons why when people can't make it they they can't make it for good reasons. So, um, you know, no, I mean, you guys want him to grab the mic today? You want to volunteer him? That's on the spot. All right, brother Greg. Thank you. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for doing it. Brother Bill. I just wanted to comment about God's sovereign will. Uh, God's sovereign will, although he is a sovereign, like, uh, like, any, like a king, well, it's a king, he, he, he's not... Um, He's not random in his uh, will, like like a crazy Nero or something like. That. His will is grounded in who he is, his character, and they will always be consistent, not divorced from each other. So, um, his will will always make sense on some level. And I mean, we're limited in our understanding of it, but. It will make sense in, you know, with his character, in line with his character. Of who he is. We, yeah. Dependable. Yeah. We can yeah. depend on that. Yeah, and that's an important point. And we're going to see that, that 
God and his will, his will is not arbitrary, right? It doesn't, remember, he, he's without passions. He's without changeable emotions. His, his desire and his determination to do what he's going to do, we're going to see in just a minute, is unchangeable. Uh, that God has fixed his mind to do what he has determined to do for the sake of his glory, and that will be done. Uh, it will not fluctuate, period. And, and that scares some people, but for me, it's one of the greatest comforts. It means that I can't mess it up. I can't jack up God's will and, and, and cause it not to happen. That I can rest in him and know that he's going to do what's good and right according to his nature and character for the sake of his glory, and I, I am invited to be a part of that. Um, it's a great encouragement. Thank you. Thanks for the comment, Chris. Or, yeah, Chris. Now that I don't have to walk up there, I'm willing to comment. Um, <laughs> have to fear you rushing. Yeah, that too. Me, right? That's... Uh, I, I was just thinking, what, what about, the, like, you know, there's, there's God's sovereign will here, and then there's uh, God's permissive will, or... or because I, I know a, a lot of times I think, you know, maybe we modern day Christians can say, like, oh, look, look what God did for me. Like, the, isn't this great? Like, look what God provided for me. And it's like, no, you just bought that, you know, like that. And, and, and I think people can say, like, well, this is God's will. And, and yes, it is his sovereign will, but that doesn't mean it was a, like a good decision. Yeah. Um, amen. So. We can get into that now. It's probably as good a time as any. Um, maybe before we begin to launch into the confession side of this, what the confession is strictly talking about is God's sovereign will, his, his will of decree, as it's called. Um, you could call it his secret will, the will that, that we don't know, but only God knows. Because uh, who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor, right? Um, or even uh, 1 Corinthians, that's Romans 11, 36, 1 Corinthians 2, you know, the only, the only one who knows the mind of God is the Spirit of God. So we're talking about the will of God that is strictly relegated to his mind, his thought process, his determination. On the flip side of that, um, this is what Deuteronomy 29, 29 is getting at when it says, the secret things belong to the Lord but that which is revealed belongs to us and to our sons that we may do this law. Now, there are secret aspects to God's will we don't know, and we never will know until they come to pass. We can know definitively what God's secret or decretive will is when it happens. But his prescriptive will or his revealed will will or his permissive will as it's described that is clearly made known to us in his word and that is the rule by which we are to govern our lives we are not to govern our lives based upon God's secret will because we don't know it uh, and but you know and that's the will we're always trying to figure out when we're seeking to make a big decision right like god if i go to this college what's going to happen right do you want me to marry this person uh, just give me a revelation. Help me know if I'm doing the right thing. Well, that's the lazy way out. And God doesn't want lazy children. Right? He has given us rules and guidelines that reveal to us his, what he desires of our lives. And we are to order our lives according to what he has revealed. And we are to leave the secret stuff in God's hands. Um, and so, yes... There is a difference between God's prescriptive, what, what he has prescribed for us to be doing, and God's decretive will, what he has decreed, will absolutely come to pass. Um, and I appreciate your point. Sometimes we can, I'll use, I'll use myself as an example, we can purchase a vehicle, right, with money that we don't have, and we've received that vehicle, and that's a grace from God. He has permitted that to take place. But is that really the way that God would have had me go about purchasing a vehicle, vehicle obtaining a car? Maybe his prescriptive will would have led me in a different direction, but by his decretive will, I know that he has allowed me to receive that car as, as, as a benefit, as a blessing to me, 
not because I was so righteous in, in doing it or seeking his will or what I should do, but because he has, he has decreed to let me have it. Does that well, it might not be a blessing, but in the end, it will be a blessing to all of God's people because it will work in them uh, sanctification, which is what my truck has been working into me <laughs> for the last two and a half years, right? I mean, you guys know that. I'm serious. I've had more issues with that truck. It is ridiculous. I'm having to replace the rear brakes for the third time in two years, and there's no cause for it other than defective parts. Um, I've, I've, anyway, we don't have to get into my personal things, but yes, it, is, it may not have been the way the Lord wanted me to go, but God is using it for my good to teach me a lesson because he's a heavenly father who loves me and he wants me to participate in his holiness. Therefore, he is disciplining me. Go ahead, Ms. Christie. If this is too far off topic, you can tell me. Go for it. Um, <laughs> but so... If we are to leave the secret things in God's hands, and um, I, I guess I'm trying to understand what we would do then if, if someone, or if you specifically, let's say, feel that there is personal revelation from God, is that not real then, or is... Is that just a special circumstance that can happen? Do you, do you know what I'm trying to ask? Okay. I do. Um, what we sometimes maybe call like the leading of, of the Spirit in certain situations, or other people will say that they, they have received clear revelation that they are to do this or to do that. I will tell you my position on this. And this is me. This is not the church. And I know it's hard for some people to divorce the pastor of the church from the church at large on a position like this, but I need you to do that on this topic. Um, My position on the matter is I don't know. I don't know. Um, In my own life, for example, because we're talking about me, My wife, uh, five months before I was fired from a job, had a dream. And in that dream, I was fired from my job because of the gospel, and which which was really a shock to us, like to even consider that. Not that we, not that Jamie woke up saying, "Thus saith the Lord." I had a dream, and 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 here's what's going to happen. But that she woke up and said, "Man, that was weird. I had a really intense, real dream." That, that, that you were losing your job because of the gospel. And that was weird for us to even think about because my boss and I at that time seemed to have fellowship in the gospel. And five months later, I mean, we didn't think anything of it. We didn't order our lives according to it, but five months later, that happened. That very thing happened. And um, that was during a really hard time. Uh, our son was dying, and life just already felt you know, uh, chaotic. And the Lord was being very, I believe, the Lord was being very gracious to us and just preparing us for what was coming. Does that mean that every time Jamie has a dream, I need to write it in the back of my Bible and hold on to it as a word from God? No, I don't believe that at all. And I believe that when things like that happen, they need to be approached with great caution. And you do not need to order your life according to that. You need to order your life according to God's revealed will in his word. And whatever he decides to bring about, he will bring about. Um, That may seem vague in uh, in not answering your question, uh, but I think that that's the safest place to stand. Like when you really have an inclination, you believe God has called you to do something, first question that needs to be asked is, does it line up with God's word? If it does not line up with God's word, then it is not of God, period. No matter how strongly you feel that it's what God would have you do. Um, you know, people marry unbelievers thinking that God has called me to marry this person. Well, has he though, right? Has his word called you to marry that person? No, it hasn't. So you may feel strongly about it, 
but it's not what God has actually called you to do. Uh, that's just an example. Um, you, know, you can multiply that out, but I think at the bottom, uh, at the bottom level, we always run back to God's word, uh, and that's where we take our stand. Do you, have, do you want to ask anything or any clarifying comment? Or my Hebrew professor, every time he ends a class, I guess it's so annoying. He he says. Uh, any questions, comments, hilarious rejoinders? And it's like every now and then one of the students will try to offer a hilarious rejoinder. And it's so funny. Thursday I actually piped in and I said, I don't think that qualifies as a hilarious rejoinder. Um, and I, anyway, any questions, comments, hilarious rejoinders? No. Um, <clears throat> what we're getting to here. In, in relation to God and the Holy Trinity is uh, what, what governs God's actions in relation to his creation. If this is the kind of God that made all things, this God that is un, un, unapproachable by his creatures in and of themselves, then what governs his actions within his creation? Um, and the confession confesses he works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Absolute autocracy, right? He rules absolutely over all things. As Lauren quoted uh, Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Do you, I, I rejoice at that thought that God is so absolutely free that he can do whatever he wants to do. Whatever he wants to do. Isaiah 46.10 adds to this. It says that he is the God who declares the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. My purpose will be established, and I will do whatever I want to do. I I joyfully serve a God like that, not dependent on me to help him make up his mind. I am a weak man, and I need, even this morning, I needed help making a decision on what to do in the service later today. I, 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 I need input. I need guidance. I need direction from others around me. God does not. He is absolutely self-sufficient, and he will act with surety according to his own desire and will. When we talk about God's will, this sovereign will of God, we're talking about that determination of God by which all that God wants to exist and be actually comes into existence and gains being. It's the determination of God to bring into existence and cause to happen everything that he wants to exist and wants to happen. Uh, Some systematic theology say that this even includes God's self-existence. That he his self-existence is dependent upon his own will, which I don't really, be, probably because I don't understand it quite well enough, what they mean by saying that. I'm uncomfortable going that way because could God ever will not to exist? No, absolutely not. I mean, I think that's probably their point, but that he wills himself to be. Uh, would someone be willing to open up to Revelation 4.11? And read, read loud enough. Or actually, we have a runner for the mic. So is anyone, anyone willing to do that? Raise your hand. Eliana? Are you going to read? No? Okay. okay. Oh, Mike? You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by you, your will they exist and were created. Yeah, so what happens? What's being explained in that verse? 
He's worthy to receive glory, honor, and power because he created all things. Because of your will, they existed and were created. Which one came first? Creating the thing or willing to create the thing? The will, right? The determination to do it. And uh, just notice from that verse, what all does that encompass? That will to create all things. What's included under that umbrella? Is there anything that comes into existence that God didn't will to happen? Is that even possible, right? No, it's not. We don't believe in spontaneous generation, right? God brings things about that he wills to bring about, and he does it because he is pleased to do it, period. Now, notice the confession says two things about God's will, describes it in two different ways. First of all, it says that his will is an unchangeable will. Is that true? Does God's will ever change? This sovereign, decretive will, will it ever change? I see some no, and I see most of you just sitting there. Mike? Brother Mike. Whenever we talk about God's will, I keep my mind keeps going back to um, Moses on the mountain, where God says, "Leave me, I'm going to destroy these people, and I will raise up other someone from you." And then Moses humbles himself and, and, and says, "Destroy me then too." And then he relents, God relents. So in answer to your question, does his will ever change? I mean, that's what I think about. I mean, is that right? Or I mean, in this case, it seems like God's will changed. Sure. But did his decretive will change? What he decreed to take place, did that change? Didn't God reveal enough to Moses for Moses to know that God's ultimate priority is his glory. And when God moved to destroy the Israelites because of their sin, he said, get back, Moses. I will destroy all of them, and I will make a new people out of you. What did Moses realize would mean? that? The, what did Moses realize that that would mean if God actually went through with doing that? What would the nations say? That you were strong enough to bring them out of Egypt, but you weren't strong enough to bring them into their own land? For the glory of your name, God, do not do this thing. Right? And God was pleased to answer that prayer. God decreed that that whole interaction with Moses would take place to teach Moses a lesson and to teach us a lesson, and to draw Moses out into the kind of leadership that God had called him to exercise. God didn't change his will as far as what he was going to do with his people. Uh, He was working with Moses to reveal something about his character. And if you realize the context there, that immediately leads Moses to fall down in wonder and say, God, show me your glory. Because I just don't see it. Like, what in the world is the fullness of this glory? That where you would say you would destroy this people, and based on my intercession, now all of a sudden you agree not to? And that leads to this foundational revelation of God in Exodus 34, 6, and 7. When he says, Moses, I, he says, show me your face. Let me, show me your glory. And God says, no man can see my face and live in Exodus 33, 19. But I'll do this for you, Moses. I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. And I will cause all of my goodness to pass before you. And I will proclaim my name to you. And in Exodus 34, 6, and 7, God comes down to do that. And he, he, and he proclaims his glory to Moses, saying, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and compassionate, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, 
right? Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. That whole scene of Moses interceding with God not to destroy the people of Israel leads to the fullest revelation of the glory of God in relation to his people that we have in the scriptures next to the revelation of the incarnation of Christ. The revelation of God in the incarnation of Christ. God, God decreed all of those events, that all those events would take place for the sake of revealing his glory. And if you realize what that means, that means God had to decree that the Israelites sin against him. Because without that, this wouldn't have taken place. This revelation of his glory and forgiveness and grace and how deep his compassion truly is. And we're going to get into that more fully in weeks ahead. But Brother Warren. Yeah, some some of those events and how they're even described in Scripture naturally create a challenge of understanding it that way. Um, but I also think about it, if if his will can be changed, then his will becomes secondary to something else, to events or circumstances or some other will. Absolutely. And if so, then how is he God? That's right. That's right. His will can be manipulated, right? In that in that sense. I, I definitely agree with you. The thing that's always made me a little nervous about that is it feels like we're saying, well, God was bluffing or, or almost was being deceitful, like he wasn't being honest, where he was saying, I'm going to do this. And then, okay, I'm not. But really, he knew he wasn't ever going to do it. And I, it just, I, I, I've given the same explanation, and it lines up with, I think, you know, my theology, and it, I think it's, but it, it just I, I, it leaves me feeling slightly unsettled. No, yeah, well, let me clarify. I don't at all mean that had, had the intercession not taken place, God would not have destroyed them because he really wasn't intending to do that anyway. That's not what I mean. The, the issue here is you have to understand the relationship between God's sovereign decree and his decree to use means to an end. That God has decreed things to come about, and he has decreed to use means to bring those things about. And that is, we see that every day in our own lives. God decrees that we, as children of God, hold on just a second, says that God decrees that we, as children of God, would be conformed to the image of his Son. But how does that take place? That takes place through the rigorous daily grind of sanctification that we participate in. We pray, we seek his face in the word, we confess our sins, we seek to live and cultivate holy lives of godliness unto his name. All of those things are under God's sovereign hand, and we don't do any of those things apart from God allowing it to be done. And yet he's called us to do it, right? To exercise our will and our minds and the use of means in order to seek his face. And so there's this relationship between God's absolute decree of what will take place and, what, and, the, and the manner in which he has decreed for that end to come about, and that is the use of means. Uh, he used the means of ungodly sinners to bring about his predetermined plan of salvation in Christ through crucifying him. You know, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that more. We'll get into that more. Uh, Susan. I was just going to say that I've, I've come to some peace about that myself, um, thinking that God is not surprised by anything. And so how can all of these things happen? And all of, uh, but he's on his throne. Um, with the story of Abram uh, and Isaac, and that uh, I don't remember who said it or how this was revealed, but um, just that God knew that Abraham, Abram, didn't know what he was going to do, but he needed Abraham to know. He needed him to believe. He needed his obedience. He's, uh, you know, all of that um, allowed in order for Abraham to come to a deep, ab abiding, obedient faith in God by stepping all the way through that unknowing. Um, it wasn't that God didn't know what he was going to do. And same, I think, of in this situation um, that Mike had mentioned, that it's not that God doesn't know. It's that he's, his bigger 
paradigm for all things happening throughout all... He's outside of time, as we talked about last time, so he doesn't need there to be a sequential order of things. He needs us to walk through a sequence to arrive to where he knows we're all going, already going to arrive, and then my mind gets blown and I have to stop. Yeah, well, let, me, let me just change one word that you were using there. God doesn't need... God doesn't need us, but, but we do. We need that, right? We need to be brought through the crucible in order to be purified. And that, that crucible of testing our faith happens every single day when that faith gets challenged and, and we're faced with temptation and we have to decide, will we bow the knee to our own will and our desires and our sinful flesh or will we bow the knee to God's sovereign will, trusting in him and in him alone? That we don't know how this is going to work. Abraham... God, I don't know how. I don't know how I'm going to have a kid at 99 years old. Uh, my wife's womb is as good as dead. I don't know how you're going to do it. Let me try her concubine. Uh, that didn't turn out to anything good either, right? Even down to this day. Um, but bringing Abraham to the point where he was absolutely trusting in God and in God alone to fulfill his word, that, that, he needed to walk through the path he walked in order to reach that point. Yeah. So. Sacrificing his son. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, amen. I didn't think about that one. Miss Christie. Sorry. That's all. No. Hey, don't be sorry. Right. No one be sorry. It's fine. We're not rushed. I, I'm agreeing with everything you're saying and everything that Susan's saying, but I don't feel like any of that addresses the fact that God specifically said, I'm going to destroy this people, and then didn't do it. That's where I get unsettled. I, I understand. Um, there is, just in reading, you can read Wayne Grudem. He has a really good uh, section on this in his systematic theology. And even Louis Burkhoff, if, if you, you can find it online. Um, even reformed, even the, the most brilliant minds of, of solid doctrinal men, uh, doctrinally solid men, have to reach a point where they say, I don't know. I don't know. Um, does all of this mean that we're automatons and God has just strictly ordained everything and, and we just, our actions don't matter? Well, that's clearly not what God has revealed in his word. And yet at the same time, he has revealed his absolute, the absolute nature of his sovereign control over all things, including sin that we're going to see. And how do those th two things relate? I don't know. How, how does it relate where God says, I'm going to destroy this people, and then Moses bows the knee and pleads with God not to do it, and the Lord says, okay, I won't. How does that, how does that line up with, with numbers? Um, 2319, where it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. ESV translates that, I think, change his mind. Um, has he said and will not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? You know? um, so there's a point where you have, you, we come to the point of mystery, and I, I hate using that because it's a cop-out, but I think in, in large measure it's true. We come to the point where we have to confess there's mystery here and, and a fog that we can't penetrate, but will we trust in God? Will we submit to him? Will we continue to walk with him through that, even through that mystery? That's what concerns us. Ms. Nancy. He did destroy these people. He did not allow them to get to the promised land. He killed every one of them off through natural mm -hmm. death. And yeah. in a way, that's <laughs> what he said he would do. That's very true. Um, and that reminds me of something in, the, in that context of the passage I believe it's in Numbers, the account where uh, 
Numbers is recounting these events and the book of Numbers. And the Lord says basically that he would spare them, but none of those who had defied his glory would, would be allowed to live, that the one who sinned against him would be punished. God, God keeps his word in that, in that realm, yes. He punishes sin, but he didn't destroy the whole nation. And, that, and that's the point, right? Like, he didn't destroy the whole nation like he said he would. And so how does that relate with Moses pleading and intercession and God's determination and his decree not to do that and to bring things about exactly as they happened? That's the point of mystery where I, I don't, I'm not qualified to answer, to give an answer. Is it similar to just like a person when God says he'll punish sin, you know, we won't inherit the kingdom of heaven? But, but then he still shows us grace, right? So it's, is it similar to that where he's so, like what's, what's, you yeah. know, just, but then he's still through Christ is able to show grace? If I understand what you're asking. Um, I'm just comparing that to with with Moses and God saying I'm gonna you know kill Israel or wipe out your nation, but yeah. then he but then he shows grace, so it's like he's saying like this is what's right to do, yeah. like uh, like Nineveh in the book of Jonah, the Lord also, saying, I'm gonna destroy Nineveh, yeah, but yeah. Nineveh repents and God spares them, and and also us, all of us, and us, that's right, um, yes, and I think, okay. So I'm starting a blog that, that is going to be titled Into the Weeds because that's what I do. I like to go into the weeds, and that's what we always wind up doing under my, under my leadership. And I think there's a place for that. But drain the swamp. What's that? Just <laughs> drain the swamp. Uh, yeah. uh, no, anyway, I'm not going to go there. Um, when we're talking about the use of means, God's decree to use means unto his ends, we need to understand the use of means in a relational capacity or in a relational framework is a better way to say that. God has decreed that we interact with him relationally. Um, those who continue in their sin and refuse to love the knowledge of the truth and so be saved will be in relation to God based upon those choices and those actions. Those who, by grace, repent and come to God for forgiveness and mercy and find salvation in Christ's name will be in relation to God based upon that. And that's how it can say that both the believer and the unbeliever will be judged according to their deeds. Romans 14 and Revelation, the Lord brings us up and judges us according to the deeds that we've done in the body, whether good or evil. Well, we know that we're not saved by works, so what does that mean? Um, well, it means that the, the, the fruit of our lives will demonstrate the relationship in which, the relationship which we have with, with the Lord, the means of walking with God in this way. Um, uh, here. God has determined means, and those means function relationally with God. Um, so when Moses, when God tells Moses, I'm going to destroy all of them, get back Moses, Moses responds as one who is in relationship with the Lord, and he begins to plead with God. And that's what God has decreed. That's how God has decreed that we live with him, that we walk with him, uh, that we don't become presumptuous uh, and just presuming upon his grace, uh, and, and lazy, um, but that we walk with him according to his will has, according to the ways his will has called us to walk with him as revealed will. Does that make sense? I feel like I just bogged that down. Um, God is determined to, relate, to, to, to walk with us in relationship. Okay. Um, as Spurgeon said in the opening chapter of Lectures to My Students, he's, he's telling his, his students, listen, it is true that those who are uh, maybe not the sharpest you know, tools in the shed, that God has determined to use them to great, great end and great benefit for the sake of his name. Um, but as for us, we need to order our lives based upon his revealed will. Let the secret things remain with God. Let us order our lives according to what God has revealed in his word. 
what he wants us to do. And I think we need to be content to stay there. Uh, one day, you can ask the Lord Jesus all you want about why he did not destroy the Israelites when he said he would, um, and he responded to Moses' pleadings and, and didn't. Uh, you can ask him all the intricacies about that, and, and he will be able to explain to it, explain it to you in, in a very clear and legible manner, unlike what I'm trying to do. Um, It's easier for us to understand that he relents from punishing sin when it's our necks on the line, maybe. <laughs> Whereas... True. Like, like none of us have a problem with that, right? Right, right. <laughs> God has decreed, I will, I will damn all sinners, right. right? And we respond in repentance and faith, and the, Lord offer, and the Lord gives us forgiveness in Christ, right? We're not complaining about that. Yeah, very, very good. Yeah, thank you. Miss Susan. And we're still talking about in this mortal lifetime. Temporal. So that his, yeah. uh, you know, he, he will destroy all sinners, and he did destroy all the Israelites. And, you know, death is his decree, and the only way out is Christ. So that, to me, I think sort of answers some of that. He is true to that ultimate overarching word no matter what we do in this time realm. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's press on. Um, the specific sovereign will of God that we're talking about, that the confession is talking about here, uh, is described here as an unchangeable will. We see this in Psalm 33, verses uh, 10 and 11. It says that, oh goodness, we're almost out of time. Let's, I can't believe that. Um, it says that the Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. And the plans of his heart from generation to generation. Psalm 139, 18 through 91, or 89 through 91, it says, uh, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. This sovereign will of God whereby he orders creation, and ordains whatsoever will come to pass is an unchangeable will in God and for the very reason that Warren brought out. If it could change, then that means there is another will distinct from God's will that is being interjected into the determining process. And that cannot be if God is truly the only absolute sovereign God. So let's end it. Let's end it there. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, these precious truths, and as hard as they are for us to grasp, and as challenging as they are at times for us to understand, Lord, we thank you that we can bow in humility before you, and we can rest securely in your hands in the name of Christ. And we can know that everything you have revealed about yourself is goodness. Everything you've revealed about yourself is righteousness and just justice, Lord, and I pray that we would rest with you there. Uh, help us walk with you, Lord, and, and pay attention to all the evidences of your nearness with us in our daily lives this week. Uh, help us worship you, Lord, and help us trust in your sovereign will that will bring about our ultimate good in Christ Jesus. And be with us now, Lord, as we come to worship as a gathered body of believers. May your presence be uh, known among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.